Hey everybody, how are we this evening? Just checking the um, boards, the phones in the right place. Put down, it's all right. Yeah, it's fine. I'm just setting up my phone so I can see comments. Um, just do that. Hi Inferno, how are you this evening? Let's see if they respond. Hi, La, is it Lau13 Ladybird? Or Law13 underscore? I'm good, what about you sir? I'm very well, thank you. Very, very well. Another crazy day in lockdown for everybody. Oh, thank you very much, Cricket Crazy. Hey, uh, is it Benin? Sorry, I can't really read that without my glasses on. Hope that was pronoun pronounced correctly. Well, I was, wow, 25 people on already. Hey, Jordan. Oh, I probably shouldn't have started this because uh, I'm gonna, people are going to be upset if I don't read there. Give them a shout out now. So I better stop. Okay. Right, well, I'm, it's bang on, it's just gone seven o'clock, so I'm going to make a start, if that's okay, so we can um, try and get this done in the hour. So, I've got a few sort of introductory not. Oh, right, I'm not reading that comment out. Right, okay, so I've got a few things I just want to quickly read through, and then um, we'll make a start, okay? So, obviously, welcome to the live stream. Um, hopefully some of you were here last Thursday when I had to climb out the window and uh, do the NHS clap. So I hope this is a better day and a better time, um, 7 o'clock. Um, so what I'm going to do is go through my notes pack. So there's a copy of the notes that I would give to my students. If you notice mine are filled in, obviously. Um, so somebody mentioned last week about printables. So I've put a link, hopefully you've managed to print it off, you can, you've got access to it. So there's a link to the blank version about this, about an hour, cricket crazy, hopefully less. Um, so this is, um, the, the link to the PDF is in the, um, in the description. Um, I'm still learning how to stream from the iPad, I haven't quite cracked that yet. Um, but if you, if you guys genuinely prefer this format, I'm more than happy to just crack on and do this. Um, the only thing about the iPad is it might be better for when we start looking at past exam questions, um, when it's obviously difficult to put an entire question, write an entire question on the board. So that's something I'm working on. Uh, obviously, if you're not subscribed, please do so. I can see seven people have kindly already liked this which is nice of you. You haven't actually, we haven't done anything yet, so you might regret doing that, hopefully not. So if you're not subscribed, please do. So obviously you get all the um, notifications if I'm doing any other stuff. Um, so Wednesday at seven o'clock, it's um, a whole topic we'll go through. Next week it's organic synthesis. So that's what my students are doing. Um, so I'm gonna do that with you guys or anybody who wants to watch next Wednesday, seven o'clock. Uh, organic synthesis and I'll post the the link to the um, live stream with the notes PDF link in there and then the following week I'll be doing analytical techniques so that's going to be mass spec uh, infrared and then sort of the, the kind of exam questions that come off the back of that after that so that's three weeks time I think I'm going to start looking at exam questions Somebody actually messaged me today on YouTube and asked when will I start doing exam questions. So that's kind of, that's how I decided I would start doing exam questions. Um, so if you want to, um, if you want a particular topic, I know somebody last week mentioned mechanisms. That's always a great lesson to do. So you need to tell me what you want so that I know what to prepare. Okay. Um, so yeah, get in, get in touch to choose which topic you'd like to cover. If there's any of my students here now, obviously I don't know who's on and a lot of names are 
you know, YouTube names are a bit random. So if you are one of my students, will you email me, please, to let me know that you're here? And I would, uh, yes, I will do uh, the all the AS organic organisms. Yeah, I will do. Definitely. That's that's your there's quite a few people asking for that now. Uh, so, yeah, any of my students, please uh, give me an email um, sort of now-ish, if you don't mind, so I can see that you're here. You don't have to be here. This is a voluntary session for my students, but um, it, I'd like to know who's here from my lot. OK, right. I think that's all of my notes that I wanted to mention. So we'll make a start. OK, so I'm literally going to go through this. OK, um, so hopefully you have got a copy of it in front of you. If you haven't, it's not a, it's not a bad thing because you can always go back to the description at a later date and try and print it out if you can, or if you've got the facility on an iPad or something like that to actually write new notes, which some of my students are lucky enough to be able to do, then you can watch the video back and fill these in, okay? Right, so the notes start off by saying that uh, haloalkanes or halogenoalkanes Group of organic compounds that contain at least one halogen atom. So as with alcohols or carbocations, which hopefully you've already studied, these can be classified as primary, secondary or tertiary. So I've got the names of three haloalkanes on the board and you'll notice that this one here is slightly named slightly differently to the one in the notes. You'll see in a second, okay? So chloroethane, two carbons for the eth bit. Okay, straightforward. Two bromobutane, let's do skeletal now. One, two, three, four. And then the um, bromines are number two, one, two, or you could put it there, one, two. Let's go for that one. So that's that one. And two iodo, two methyl propane. Let's do skeletal again because it's much faster. So propane, one, two, three. 2 iodo, so there's carbon number 2, let's put an iodine on there, 2 methyl, so we need a methyl on there. Okay, so this one's primary, and that's because the carbon that's bonded to the halogen atom is only bonded to one carbon directly. This carbon is bonded to one two directly so that's secondary this carbon is bonded to one two three so this one is tertiary okay says reconnecting can you still can you still see me and hear me by the way just it's saying reconnecting on my ipad but i can see that the clock's still going all right okay thank you uh low so i'll uh, i'll keep going right so in terms of reactivity it says in the notes the carbon halogen bond in haloalkanes is polar okay so let's just we'll use this one on the board so this is a polar bond OK, and the reason for that is there's a difference or there's a significant difference in electronegativity between carbon and chlorine. OK, carbon and hydrogen, obviously they're different atoms, so they have different electronegativities. But the difference between electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen is so close together, it's really small, that that's classed as a non-polar bond, a CH bond. But the CCL bond, there's enough of a difference to make it polar, to put a dipole across it. And so therefore the carbon has a slightly positive charge on it and the chlorine has a slightly negative charge on it. And obviously that's because the chlorine has got a greater share of the electron pair, that's in the definition for electronegativity. Um, so it's got a greater share of the electron pair in that covalent bond. So the electron pair is sitting a bit closer 
to the chlorine. So it's slightly more negative than that carbon. Okay, so um, this slightly positive carbon is able to attract a species containing a lone pair of electrons and therefore haloalkanes are attacked by things that can donate a lone pair of electrons, in other words, nucleophiles. Okay, so haloalkanes are attacked by nucleophiles. And that's, they are electron, these things here are electron pair, must say pair, donors. Okay. So the examples that I've got in the notes of nucleophiles, so the examples include the hydroxide ion, and I'm going to write it like this, um, because you'll, well, you'll see why when we do the mechanism. Um, I teach, sorry, I know there's loads of questions popping up on the stream, but if I answered them all, we would be here till midnight. Um, somebody's just asked me which exam board do I teach. I teach um, OCRA, I have to think about that. Uh, I teach OCRA. Please don't all leave if, you, if you're not doing OCRA, because chemistry, it's the same chemistry, it doesn't matter what exam board you do. Obviously, there's slight differences in the boards, but, you know, at the end of the day, and I know for a fact from Twitter, some chemistry teachers that follow me have told their students to... Right, you do OCRA, that's good to know. Right, okay, so other Twitter chemistry teachers have told their students to, to be here tonight, so hopefully some people are here tonight from that recommendation. And I know for, for a fact from these teachers that they don't do OCRA. So if the teacher thinks it's worth coming to this, then hopefully you guys do as well. Okay. But there's always slight differences in syllabus, but the bulk of it's the same. Okay. Right. So examples are the hydroxide ion, a water molecule could, could um, donate an electron pair. And also the only other one I'm going to bother with tonight is the ammonia molecule. So NH3, obviously the lone pairs on that nitrogen there. So all three of these things have got a pair of electrons that they can donate to this carbon here, okay? Or this carbon here, or this carbon here, okay? Because the dipoles across that bond, okay? And the last thing on this first sheet is when hal halogenoalkanes or haloalkanes, when they react, the halogen substitutes with the nucleophile, okay? So basically what you're gonna see, there's only one reaction you need to know actually, for, for OCRA anyway, there's one reaction, and that's the substitution of the halogen for an OH group, okay? And you'll see how we can do that reaction in the next slide or the next page of this, okay? So there you go. Oh, the other thing I was going to say is I've already posted the video, but I've actually set some questions for my students on this on the, this topic. And that video is also already available in my live lessons playlist that I put together the other day. So you might want to, when you finish this video, you might want to check that one out. The link to the questions is in the video and you can have a go at the questions and then watch my video when I go through the answers. Okay. What day is? Wednesday. Wednesday at 7. Okay. Um, the, the one I do with my students, which is when I go through the questions, um, what I've been doing is making that sort of, it's called Unlisted on YouTube, um, which means that only my students can, can attend. But then as soon as it's uploaded onto YouTube, I can switch it to public and then anybody can watch it. Okay. So... I'm still not sure whether that's the best thing to do. I'm, there might be people tonight who are thinking, I would like to watch that video live so I can ask questions and stuff like that. But I'm not kind of sure where I stand with my sort of bosses on that one. That's why I've, I've kind of had to keep them, keep it separate for my students. I don't think my students would mind. I think it's more like my bosses, okay. All right, so 
hopefully that all made sense and it sort of set the scene for how these halogen oil canes are going to behave when they react. I'll get rid of that now, don't need that. Okay, so the only reaction you need to know about is in OCR8 is hydrolysis, okay? So in the notes, I've got the definition for hydrolysis there. So that's the chemical breakdown of a substance by reaction with water or aqueous acid or aqueous alkali, okay? So in hydrolysis reactions, the halogen atom, I've already said this, the halogen atom is replaced by an OH group. So we're specifying now the, the group that's going to do the sort of substitution. It's an OH group substitutes for the um, halogen. And obviously you're going to make an alcohol. Okay. If you carry out the hydrolysis with water, then it's slow. It's really, really slow reaction. So what we tend to do is reflux. So hydrolysis. Typically, reflux, and I've been busy drawing pictures to make it a bit quicker, okay? So we see that's your reflux apparatus there, <clears throat> excuse me. So if your um, halogenoalkanes in there, um, and you put some water in there, and you heat it up, you reflux in it, it'll eventually um, it'll eventually become an alcohol, okay? But typically, it's refluxed, um, refluxed a haloalkane with something like sodium hydroxide, but you must put the aqueous in, because that's the reference to the water conditions, the, um, the aqueous bit, okay? Right, so, a couple of examples for you. BG1, we're going to just do a couple of equations. The first one is the hydrolysis of one chloropropane with water. And the second one is one chloropropane with aqueous sodium hydroxide. Okay, so the first one, so it was one chloropropane, one, two, three, Cl, with water. Okay. And that's going to give us basically the, an OH from this is going to substitute for that chlorine. So it's going to one, two, three, OH. So what's left over? An H from that and a CL of that, HCl. Okay. And because there's water kicking about, this will be aqueous. You'll see why that's important when we get on to the experiment. Okay. The next one was the same haloalkane, one, two, three, plus NaOH. That's going to substitute for that, one, two, three. But this time we're going to get NaCl. AQ. Okay. So whatever your haloalkane is, you're going to get a, a substitution, a swapping over of the OH group, the nucleophile with the halogen, okay? And that's pretty much it. The only thing I could say is just to finish this off, what's that alcohol called? Propan 1 ol okay? So that would be that. So we'll look at the mechanism now. Now I know some people have already said, well, I do a... A video just on mechanisms. Well, here's one of them now. Uh, let's... Can I just ask, is this is this working okay? Um, sort of working from this and putting the, the, the bulk of it on there? Just waiting for somebody to go, no, it's rubbish. 39 people and that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martha. Yes, yes, it's working. Good. Okay. You're happy with this. Do you think the iPad 
method is perfect. Oh, wow. Oh, Lucy, I know you. There's probably more than one Lucy in the country. But yeah, great. Oh, I know Rebecca as oh, okay. Nice, nice. Okay, good, 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 good. Do you think the iPad system would, would be any better or not? So, this or the iPad? Michael, I have just come to say. <laughs> All my students are now saying hiya. So, uh, yeah, right, I'll crack on with the lesson. Right, okay. So, Newton Euphilic substitution. Just be careful, there's only one L at the end of nucleophilic. It's a really common mistake that, to put two L's in there um, and you would be marked down if you spell that wrong. iPad would be better, right? Yeah, I, I'm probably agree with you then. The only thing is you wouldn't say me then, so that's probably, well, that's probably a good thing, isn't it? Nucleophilic substitution. Okay, right, so... I've got a very, very straightforward mechanism for the notes. So it's the hydrolysis of chloromethane with aqueous sodium hydroxide. Okay, chloromethane with aqueous sodium hydroxide. So really simple. So we're going to go displayed formula for this. So chloromethane is obviously only what one carbon. Okay, so there's... Um, Let's put the dipole on straight away. You've always got to do that. Message retracted. Ooh, wonder what that was. Uh, delta plus, delta minus. So they always want to see that dipole. Remember these bonds aren't polar, the CH bonds. Right, so it's reacting with sodium hydroxide. All we're interested in is the hydroxide ion, okay, for the mechanism anyway. So we're going to draw an OH ion, OH minus ion, sorry. I'm going to put the lone pair on because when I when I sort of interact these two things, the pair of electrons, remember this is a nucleophile, it's going to donate an electron pair to this electron deficient carbon. We've got to draw a curly arrow, that's a bit straight actually, a curly arrow from here, this lone pair to that carbon, okay? And that normally would score you a mark. In, a, in an exam. The second mark is usually for the dipole and the next curly arrow which goes from the middle of that double, sorry, the middle of that bond onto there. Okay, so dipole and curly arrow would get you the second mark. And then it's a nice easy mechanism this one. So nothing's happened with these three hydrogens. The OH has now formed a covalent bond with that carbon. There it is there, so OH, and that CL has been sort of kicked off, but it's gained an electron, because it already had one of these electrons in the bond, but it's gained the carbon electron, so it becomes negatively charged. And sometimes you see the pair of electrons shown on that um, halide ion. You don't have to, but you can if you want, okay? So I'll just run through that again in words. So the first thing that happens, lone pair of electrons on the nucleophile is donated to the electron deficient carbon. This repels, the second thing that's happening, it's repelling the pair of electrons in this, this polar bond completely onto the chlorine, okay, in this case. Now, I'll just put a star here Sometimes I might say what kind of bond fission is involved in this mechanism. So this is heterolytic fission. So the way this bond's broken, it's broken heterolytically. Okay. Um, and then basically the new product formed is an alcohol. This is uh, methanol. And you also get a halide ion. And that's it. That's the mechanism. Very, very simple. And I think out of the three we need to do for um, OCRA, this is the easiest one. It's the easiest one to do. But students, sorry, say this, but students often lose marks for missing out daft little things like 
the they don't take the curly arrow from the lone pair they just take it from nothing really so that loses the mark um, sometimes that curly arrow is totally missing or the dipole's missing so just beware of that okay right so the next thing is all about the rate of hydrolysis the relative rates of hydrolysis okay so that's the next part of this topic so relative rates of hydrolysis So relative means compared to other things, okay? So relative, we're gonna compare it to other things. So it's a comparison with other halogenoalkanes, okay? Um, right, so we've already established in the hydrolysis reaction, the carbon halogen bond is broken by heterolytic fission. It follows, therefore, that the stronger the bond, the higher its bond enthalpy, the lower the rate of hydrolysis or the slower the rate of hydrolysis is going to be. OK, so let's just pretend that's that's the carbon halogen bond there. OK, so if we've got to break this bond to get the substituted, you know, the substitution on, we've got to break that bond. OK, so the harder it is to do that the longer it's going to take, okay? So, in terms of bond enthalpies, now I've got this on the notes, if you've got them in front of you. Um, so I'll just put B, E, and I remember that's in kilojoules per mole. So we're looking at the CF bond, the CH bond, CCL bond, CBR bond, I don't know why I'm looking at this CI bond, okay? I'll put the CH bond in, you'll see why in a second. So values wise, we've got 467, 413. Obviously, you don't need to know these. Uh, four, sorry, 346, uh, 290, 290, and 228, okay? So they're the bond enthalpies. So that's how much energy it requires to break a mole of that bond in kilojoules. So straight away, there's a couple of things to say. The CF bond is too strong, okay? So that doesn't hydrolyze. So I've got in the notes there, fluoroalkanes are not hydrolyzed because their carbon halogen bond is too strong. Okay, somebody's just asked me if I would provide you with this version of the notes rather than blank. Shall I, can I just get a kind of feel for what the rest of the class would prefer? Does that mean that, is there any point in this lesson if you've got the answers in front of you? That would be my worry with that as a teacher, if that's okay. My wife keeps telling me I should sell these on, uh, on, on the internet. One person asks in if that's okay. Um, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, all right. Right, so the CF bond's really strong, so that's not gonna break, okay? The CH bond's quite strong as well, so that's not gonna break. So the, the only ones we're interested in are those three there. Both versions would be nice. I can go over answers if I'm able to watch the video. Okay. Right. Okay. So you can see straight away that the CCL bond is the strongest of the three carbon halogen bonds. So that's going to break more slowly than that one. That one's going to break quite quickly because it's got a very low bond enthalpy. It's a weak bond. Okay. So in the questions that I probably don't, I shouldn't say this because I'm giving answers away, but when I've marked questions that students have, have answered in the past on this, often students go down the complete wrong avenue and they talk about 
um, polarity. Okay, they talk about electronegativity of these atoms. It's not, don't go down that route, okay? Just stick to the, the sort of facts, the basics. The carbon halogen bonds have this pattern in their bond strengths. So stick to that because it's all about bond enthalpy, okay? Uh, right, okay. So the fastest one is the iodoalkane. So fastest, slowest. So the fastest one to hydrolyze is the iodo alkane, just put alk if you don't mind. Next one is the bromo alkane. And the last one obviously is the chloro alkane. Okay, so that's the order of hydrolysis. <laughs> okay. Right, people are asking me about bond polarity, so I'm gonna I'm gonna explain I'm gonna explain it, but okay, so just stick with an easy one. So let's play um, this one versus this one. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, that's fine. Just got the CL in a in a different place, that's all. Right, so the dipole. Okay, so let's use font size. No, I'm gonna go, let's have a bit more of an extreme difference. Let's go for C, CI, okay? And CCL, sorry about this. It's because it's not on my notes, you see, so I'm doing this um, on the fly. Right, okay. So there's your polar bond. There's your polar bond, right, okay. So this one, chlorine is the most electronegative out of these two, okay? So let's put a big massive delta minus on there, a big massive delta plus on there. Nice big dipole across that bond. This one is much less electronegative, so tiny little delta minus, tiny little delta plus, okay? Right, let's bring the nucleophile in. OH minus, dot dot, OH minus dot dot so which one's going to be attracted to the which one's going to donate its electrons or be attracted more strongly to the carbon well it's obviously going to be this one because it's a bigger attraction so that's going to fly in that's going to go in a bit more slowly so that nucleophile has gone really quick into that carbon but what's got to happen for hydrolysis this blooming bond's got to break. So that's gone in quick, and now it's okay. That's sorry if that sounded weird, by the way. That's gone in more slowly. Yeah, it's gone in more slowly, but as soon as it's there, bond breaks. So that is why that one's faster. Okay, and bond enthalpy is the more significant effect to polarity okay so if you look at any textbook for a level chemistry no matter which exam board you do you welcome you welcome salman i'm kind of pleased i did that now so uh, i wouldn't normally have done that with my students it was a don't worry it was a good demonstration okay all right then good so let's go on to the um exp the experiment now i keep I bought this magnetic whiteboard. I can still look for it because I can't find it. It's on the blooming board. Right, okay. My students probably cringing at this. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Okay, so in the notes, um, I've titled this as the experiment to measure the relative rate of hydrolysis. This is a classic question where you've got to describe an experiment, okay? So it's a bit like from, if you remember back to your GCSE days, those required practicals that you might be asked about. This is one of the A-level ones, it certainly is it for OCR. I'm sure it is for the other exam boards as well. Okay, so I'll just put X, EXPT to determine the relative rates of 
hydrolysis. Okay, so let's start with, I'm just going to do a generic um, alkyl group re represented by an R, okay, Rx. So that's my hollow alkane and we're reacting it with water. So you would use water in this experiment. Remember that it's quite slow this way. We need some heat. I'll specify what temperature, yeah, we'll specify the temperature later on. So what's going to happen, that's going to become ROH, it's going to become the alcohol, and we're going to make um, HX, okay, HX, AQ. So really, HX aqueous, the H and the X won't be bonded together because they're aqueous, it would actually be two separate ions. So you'd have aqueous H plus ions and aqueous X minus ions. Right? Okay, so that is your HX aqueous. So that's the reaction that's happening. All right. So if we want to compare the relative rates of hydrolysis, we would need to use haloalkanes with different halogen on, but the same chain length. Are you talking about cricket crazy? Are you talking about then? Sorry about the pause here, guys. I don't want to go off on one and... Uh, yeah, it's because, okay, there's, this is in water, okay? So when the HX is formed, the hydrogen halide, it's in water. So any aqueous substance isn't bonded together. So if I use my pen again, okay? It, it's not bonded like that. It's actually dissociated into the water. So you've got two separate ions, both surrounded by water. So you've got the H plus ion and the X minus ion. You haven't got HX as a one thing, it's separate, okay, in the water, and that's there your aqueous ions, okay. Now, because we've got a halide ion in there, sorry, the messages disappear if I don't look quickly enough. Um, hopefully, that, that was all right, okay, thanks, good, right? Because we've got aqueous halide ions present. If we add something to, to detect them, okay, so if silver nitrate was present, AgNO3, Aq, is also present, what's it going to do? So remember that the, hal the halogen has to be replaced by the OH group. That's going to generate an aqueous H plus ion and an aqueous X minus ion. But there's also silver nitrate in the beaker as well. So as soon as that X minus ion, that halide ion forms, it's going to react with that and form a precipitate. Okay, so if AgNO3, Aq, silver nitrate is also present, we're going to get precipitate of silver halide okay silver halides oops forming okay so what do i mean by that eg eg cl if it was a chloro alkane solid now because it's a precipitate so these are joined together bonded together eg cl solid remember that's white um, or if it was a bromoalkane, you're going to get AgBr forming, which is a solid, but that's cream. And you would, if you had an iodoalkane, you would get silver iodide formed, and that's yellow. Yeah, well done, pretty crazy. Okay, so the precipitation reaction, might as well get that on and on there. Um, let's just put a star next to that. 
star next to that. So the equation, we'll just do the chloro one. So Ag plus Cq reacts with the halide ion, for example, chloride, and it forms AgCl solid. Remember, that's your white precipitate. Okay. So, hmm, don't know how good this will be. Right, let me just do, is this going to work? Don't know if you want to, I suppose what you could do is you could pause the, pause the video and take a screenshot. Or I'll tell you what, I'll just stand up close to the, no, this is terrible, sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through it. Okay. Right, the procedure. I suppose this is where the iPad would be really good. Okay. Now, another diagram that I've meticulously drawn. I've got six test tubes. Okay. So, if you were doing this experiment to determine this relative rate of hydrolysis, so what would you need to do? So you'd have three test tubes over here. So let's say one, two, and three. Okay. So in one, two, and three, what would you put in there? You would add, um, let's see, I don't know, uh, one cm cubed. Volumes don't really matter in this. Okay. I've got drops written in there, but one cm cubed of haloalkane. And um, which have I got here? And one cm cube of ethanol. Okay. So in one, two, and three, what have we got? A centimeter cubed of haloalkane. So chloro could be um, chloroethane, or it could be chloropropane, chlorobutane. Let's go chlorobutane. Chlorobutane in that one with some ethanol bromobutane in that one with some ethanol and iodobutane in that one with some ethanol okay the ethanol is just there as a solvent which website are the questions from i made them up i make these up um i don't get them from a website i'm afraid um okay so that's in one two and three so in four five and six you've got your silver nitrate. So in four, five, six, you would add, how much have I got here? Um, one cm cubed I've got of silver nitrate. Okay, so hopefully this is making sense. So you've got the haloalkanes in your um, ethanol solvent to help everything mix together there there and there four five and six you've just got silver nitrate present aqueous silver nitrate okay they're going to go in a water bath so I'll just draw this is a water bath and that's at 50 degrees C okay Remember, we need heat for this reaction, otherwise it'll be really, really slow. So we're going to put some heat into it, 50 degrees, and we're going to give them, what, five minutes? That's when we do it in class, it's about five minutes, so that they all get to roughly the same temperature. Obviously, if, you're, if they're in for longer, you, you're more sa you'd safer, they're at the same temperature. Okay? Right. And then basically all you do is you would, let's say, add four to one. So you'd add the silver nitrate to test tube one. As soon as it goes in, start your stopwatch. As soon as the precipitate forms, stop your stopwatch and record the time it takes for the precipitate. Okay. Then you would go to tube five with two. Remember, that's the bromo one. So add the silver nitrate solution to tube two, start, stop when the precipitate appears, record the time, six to three, that's your iodo one, start, stop, and record the time.
Okay, so that would be that one. So um, when at temperature, um, add the AgNO3 Aq to the haloalkane and ethanol and then time for precipitate. Sorry, this is getting a bit squashed now, but time how long it takes for the precipitate to form. And obviously you would do that again with the other two. And then just to turn it into a, a rate, rather than record the time or present the time, I'm gonna to have to go up here, sorry. So if I just put a star there, the rate is expressed as one divided by the time, okay? So that would be the relative rate of that um, hydrolysis reaction. Okay. Um, and that's it. That is that experiment. Okay. So they're all the kind of key bits of information you would need to bring in to an answer about the, the relative rates of hydrolysis experiment. Okay. And there tends to be quite a lot of marks going for this, something like this, because there's the, there's the equations, there's the, the sort of detail here that shows the examiner that you're being, you're fair, you're being fair, so you're using the same chain length of Palo Alkane, you're using the same volume, the same quantities of um, chemicals, you, you're using the water bath, you're allowing them to get the temperature, and what they do like to see now as well is, you know, what equipment would you use, what, you know, um, and they, they even want to see things like stopwatches, okay? So, um, yeah, so to very, to very, very typical question. Um, and then they might want to see these coloured precipitates and, and, you know, you know the kind of thing, I'm sure. I'm sure you've had questions like this before in homework from your teachers. Okay, right, so we're on the last leg now. We're, we're finished with the, um, the sort of, organic chemistry side of it, if you like, we're now going to go into the environmental stuff, which which we have to know about in OCR. Um, so I'll just hold this. Okay. Right, so on the notes it says organohalogen compounds in the environment. Okay, so organohalogen compounds are organic compounds with at least one halogen atom joined to a carbon chain, so obviously haloalkanes fall into that category. They possess a variety of different chemical properties, such as they are volatile, so they've got low boiling points. They're not flammable, they're very unreactive because of those strong bond enthalpies, especially the fluoro and uh, chloral ones, um, and they are non-toxic as well. And so because of those properties, they've been used massively across the world um, for things like solvents, polymers, so solvents, trichloromethane is the example I've got in the notes, polymers, so if you think of polymers with halogens in, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, PTFE, polytetrafluoroethane, so that's your Teflon, your, your non-stick pan coating, that sort of thing. Um, so they're also used in fire extinguishers, so they're non-flammable, they are uh, unreactive. They're used in refrigerants, so they're used in refrigerators, so what the volatile is an important property for that, non-flammability is important for that. Unreactivity is important for that, non-toxic, you can see why. And they're also used in aerosol propellants, or they were used in aerosol propellants. Um, so that's basically the gas that's put into your canister that will push the um, chemical out to wherever it's needed to go. So if it's, a, if it's something like a deodorant, it's got to go under your armpit from the end of the can. Sorry, it's a bit gross. But okay. 
but the problem the problem with them is their lack of reactivity which is a good thing for, for some of the things we used for was starting to be seen the, to cause lots of problems and that was around about the 1970s they started realizing that there was a massive problem with these compounds that were everywhere in the, in the world okay so the focus of this part of the topic is the ozone layer okay ozone layer okay so uh, that's obviously ozone is O3 um, so the ozone layer is found at the outer edge of the stratosphere so if this is um, the surface of the earth and we've got this layer here this is the stratosphere and the ozone layer is up here okay um, so the ozone layer is obviously massively beneficial for us as, a, as human beings because what it does is we've got the Sun up here and UV is coming through trying to get to Earth what the ozone layer does is it absorbs UV radiation so a lot less gets to Earth okay and UV especially I think UVB is the worst one um, that causes the problems UVB is linked very much to skin cancer I'm sure you know all about that from you know sort of the precautions you've got to take in the summer months especially in the UK where you've got to put sunscreen on and what have you to protect yourself from UVB okay so ozone absorbs harmful UV. I'm not going to mention you put the UVB there. The, the exam board aren't going to. No, I was just going to say I'm not going to. I'm not going to put UVB there because you don't need to know the different types of ABC, by the way. Um, so, but it's, if you're interested, it's UVB that's the one that causes the problem, the most of the problems. Um, so, ozone absorbs harmful UV. Why is it harmful? Skin cancer. Okay, right. Um, so in the stratosphere, ozone is constantly being broken down when it absorbs UV. All right. So when the UV comes, you know, UV's coming through, trying to get through, the ozone in this layer is being broken down. Okay. Into O2 and O. Okay. So that could be problematic because eventually um, that ozone is going to run out, isn't it? Because it's it's a one-way reaction. But you saw that I was hovering over that arrow. <clears throat> Excuse me. What actually happens is the O2 and the O atom, what they do is they combine and they form ozone back. So this is actually... A dynamic equilibrium so it's a constant backwards and forwards reaction but that because these have established dynamic equilibrium they happen at the same rate okay and that's taken millions and millions billions of years to establish um, but there's been this nice balance of levels of ozone in this stratosphere that have developed over millions of years and we've got this protection from harmful UV okay so CFCs now so we'll call this problem with CFCs so here you chlorofluorocarbons so remember back in you know I was saying all these massive in in the sort of uh, when did they all come into play probably about the 1930s 1940s um, people were starting to get refrigerators but they were quite common um, packaging polymers plastics was becoming massive around the world you know people were using plastic containers for things so that these things were massive in globally um, and over time they've caused they've started causing a problem 
So let's just use the example of a deodorant. So let's just imagine a deodorant. It's a terrible diagram, this. We're spraying out CFCs, okay? Because they're unreactive, they just go all the way up, not doing anything. And they end up in the upper atmosphere, in the stratosphere, okay? These unreactive CFCs just go all the way up to there. But what's up there? UV. So let's just draw a CFC. So let's go for CFF. Let's go for this one. Okay. Chloro fluorocarbon. Okay. So when this is up in the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, what's the UV going to do? Remember UV is high energy. It's going to break a bond. Which is, the, which is the weakest bond out of these, these two, CF or CL, CL. So the UV, let's just put a pair of electrons in there, it's gonna break that bond right down the middle by homolytic fission. Okay, so that's where, um, there's a pair of electrons obviously in that bond each of the um, atoms involved in the bond, so the C and the Cl, they each get the same number of electrons from the bond, that's the homo bit. So that carbon gets one of the electrons, the chlorine gets one of the electrons. So what, have they gen what are they gonna generate? Well, they're gonna generate a CF3 radical and a Cl radical as well, okay? This, is the, this causes them the problem. So these are both very reactive. So these are radicals, so we'll just say very reactive radicals. Okay, and, and the reactive, because they've got an unpaired electron, that's what the dot stands for, and they desperately want to just pair that electron, so we'll just steal some, so an atom of something else and rip the electron as well and become more stable as a result, okay? So these are very, very reactive radicals. Right, so this is, you probably recognise this from you, your, um, um, what's it called, radical substitution mechanism from uh, alkanes. This is an initiation reaction. So we'll get that on. Initiation. Sorry, my writing's not very good there. Initiation. Okay. Right, let's try and squeeze this on. Right, so we've got, Chlorine radicals kicking about up here now, so let's just put a chlorine radical up there. So what's that going to do? That's going to attack ozone. So let's just see, squeeze this in. So O3, remember that's up there, giving us protection from um, harmful UV. Chlorine radical comes along and it rips one of the oxygen atoms off there and it turns it into an O2 molecule and another radical, a ClO radical, okay? So this is a propagation step. So this is the first one. These always happen in pairs. So propagation two, this radical here, also very reactive, CLO radical, that reacts with one of these things here, the oxygen atom, and that forms another O2 molecule, so it rips that oxygen off there, and it leaves behind the chlorine radical, okay? And so if you combine those two equations to get the overall process, what you can see is if we add, so if we combine these, you just go that plus that plus that plus that, gives that plus that plus that plus that. You'll see that you'll have a ClO radical on each side of your equation, and you've also got a Cl radical on each side of the equation. So they're going to cancel out. So what are you left with? O3 plus O makes two O2s. I'm going to have to put this up here now, okay? So O3 
plus all makes two or twos. Why is that a problem? It's not reversible. So these pesky chlorine radicals are basically breaking the ozone down irreversibly, okay? And that's what's caused the problems, okay? So um, the global population um, realised there was a problem, you know, the, um, the scientists back down in so Antarctica and what have you, at these sort of stations that they, they do their research on, they realised that the ozone layer was getting thinner and thinner and thinner, uh, UV levels were increasing, and they, they could see that this was actually what was causing the problem. So the ozone layer was being irreversibly broken down. Ah, you were taught that, were you? Pretty crazy, okay. Um, that might be, do you do, I don't know whether you do OCRA or not. Um, that's the way we've, that's the way we've always done. I'm not saying yours is wrong, but um, you do, right? Okay. Well, I know for a fact that this is this is an accepted way to do it. Okay. OCRA, yeah. So I've been doing this 20, 27 years. The teacher won't change from theirs. Sometimes you can say, okay, cheers. Sometimes. Um, there's more than one way to answer the same question, so I wouldn't worry about it. Stick with what, you, what you've what you been taught. Um, have a look in textbooks, see what other textbooks say. I know for a fact in our textbooks it's, a, it's got that one there, okay? All right then. A um, couple of other things just to say here is because the chlorine radicals being reformed in the process, um, you can say that it's a catalyst, okay? So this is sometimes referred to as the catalytic decomposition of ozone. Okay. Catalytic decomposition of ozone. Okay. Cl dot, Cl radical is the catalyst. Okay, and then we finished. That's 801. If you don't mind, we might as well. There's literally just that to do. I've got a tiny bit of stuff on the back there, but that won't take very long at all. Um, just to give you another example of, of a radical that causes problems with ozone, and that's the NO radical. So I won't go through the sort of the massive explanations now because it's the same as the one you've just seen, just with different. Uh, example. Okay. Right. Okay, so um, NO radicals also um, break down. I'm going to put another keyword for breakdown you might have seen before deplete. Um, so NO radicals also break down or deplete ozone. Okay, um, so basically all you would need to uh, say here, so the first propagation step is the NO radical, NO dot reacts with O3. That's all, this NO uh, radicals are all sort of in the stratosphere um, and that's going to create uh, O2 and an NO2 radical. And then the second propagation step that radical feeds into that one, NO2 dot, plus an O atom goes to another O2 molecule and it regenerates that NO radical. So you can see that's also a catalyst as well. So again, if you were adding those two reactions together, those two steps together to get the overall equation, they're going to cancel. Uh, that's going to cancel with that. That's going to cancel with that. And you're left with overall uh, O3 plus O makes two O2s. So it's exactly the same overall reaction. Um, 
I'll put that on, I've just seen that. I'll do that for um, a future lesson, but um, I'm sticking with the, the order that I'm teaching my students in. Um, so, but I've only got two lessons left to go with, uh, two topics left to go. Um, so that's synthesis, organic synthesis, and uh, analytical techniques. And then once I've done them, I'm more than happy to take up suggestions. Okay, no problem. Great. Uh, so that's that one. And then the final thing is just what, what's, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Just a suggestion. That's absolutely fine. Like I said, stick us a comment, bang a comment into the, the comments um, after once I've closed the video down. Um, give me your thoughts, your suggestions. But that's what I'll be looking at to see what people want to, to do next. Okay, so right. So what's globally, how are they trying to tackle the problem? So um, the classic example is the Montreal Protocol. Okay, so that was uh, finalized in 1987, if you're interested. I can't imagine on your degree, about to finish your degree, no way, and you're watching this. That's and even live stream has been great today. Good, that's nice to hear. Thanks for that. Um, oh, as a teacher. Oh, wow, wow, great. That's very kind of you, um, Elena. Hope I've pronounced that right. Or is it Elena? Sorry if it's wrong. Oh, great. Didn't realise teachers will be watching. I feel a bit nervous now. Uh, <laughs> hope there's no Ofsted inspectors out there. Um, anyway, I shouldn't worry, should I? Right. Um, Montreal Protocol, the chances are the second one was right. Okay, right, okay, right. Elena, right, okay. I'll try and remember that. Um, yeah, it's not, we're not doing geography here, so I imagine, I don't know if you, some of you do geography, you've got to sort of know sort of key dates of things and timeline for stuff and what was said and who said what, I'm guessing there. Um, but I think you need to have an understanding of ways in which global communities have tried to solve this, this massive problem. Um, okay, so finalised in 1987, it's a global agreement. Um, to protect the ozone layer, ozone layer, to protect ozone, by phasing out, so getting rid of, phasing out, um, ozone, um, depleting, there's that word again, uh, substances. And the main culprits were CFCs, okay? But there are other ozone depleting, don't just think the CFCs on their own, there's other things as well, okay? e.g. CFCs. Now, since then, hydrochlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons have been added to the list of bad substances, okay? So, e.g. CFCs, HCFCs, and um, what was it? HFCs. Okay? Um, were added to the list. Now, what's the problem? The big problem with this is, well, problem number one, um, not all countries signed up. Okay, so it's kind of like what's going on at the moment. You know, the only way we can really solve what's going on at the moment with coronavirus is a global um, plan where everybody agrees to to follow the sort of the science and what have you and abide by the rules so these rules are all well and good but if some countries aren't signing up to it and some are even still using cfcs well the problem's not going to go away it won't be as bad i suppose but it won't go away and the other problem is cfcs are so unreactive they're still they're still up there Okay, they, they just hang around, 
It's called having a long residence time, so they reside in the atmosphere for a very, very long time. Um, so even though they've been sort of phased out, they're still there, okay? So they're still causing problems, they're still doing the damage, they're still doing, well, that's NO radicals, but you know what I mean, yeah? They're still doing the same thing. So that is the end of the lesson. So how long is that taken? 8.08, so an hour and... Eight or nine, an hour and nine minutes. So I can still I can see there's 22 people still there. So well done. I hope that was useful. Um, oh, thank you very much. It's a Damalola. That was very helpful. I'm pleased you thought so. Um, so yeah, very, very, very uh, surprised there's so many of you still on. Um, I don't know what the highest number of people was at one point. It might have been 30 odd that I saw. So that's great. Um, you're welcome, Hannah. Um, so 30 likes, which is good. I loved it. We'll tell my whole class. Wow. That's yeah. I hope it's a very big class. <laughs> um, so yeah, more, we'll do that again next week. Okay. But next week we're going to do, what was it again? Organic synthesis. Okay. So I'll put the link out as soon as possible. This is my first time watching you. You were so good. Excellent. Oh, that's really kind of you, Romina or Romina. Um, yeah, about 22 students. Great. Oh, well, get them all, get them all joining. <laughs> Excellent, Michael. Fantastic. That's lovely to hear. Great. I'm going to look forward to looking through this at the end. Sorry, I've, I've not really been able to um, process your messages so much because I've been sort of about, well, about two metres actually away from the board, uh, from the iPad. And my eyesight's not as great as it used to be, so I can't see the tiny little messages that are coming up on the screen. That's why I'm like going like this to see you. Okay, that's it, I think. Great. You're welcome, Cricket Crazy. I will not forget that name, will I? Um, I will see you next week. Fantastic. Right. Okay. Yeah, you too, Michael. Keep safe yourself. Yeah. So, see you next week. That's it. Right. Okay. Um, subscribe. Like. And um, tell your friends, and hopefully we'll um, we won't be you welcome, Dragon Pearl. And hopefully when you go back to college or school, you won't be too far behind. The only thing I'm worried about for my students is the practical work that I obviously can't do from home. Um, but touch wood, they are understanding the chemistry still. And um, you welcome, Rebecca, one of mine. Thank you, bye. See you later. Um, yeah, so hopefully we won't be too disadvantaged um, if we keep on top of the work. Okay, right, that's it. I'm rambling on now. Are you students? An online classroom. Um, well, I'll just do it on YouTube, Michael, to be honest, and I use Google Classroom alongside. Um, so that's how I'm doing it. Um, but I do YouTube live lessons with my students. But like I said, I don't know if you were at the start, but I do them... Um, I make them unlisted so that only my students are there um, so that if they want to follow, you know, there's not a massive number of people there. Um, anyway, I might be open to opening it up to everybody. If people are wanting to attend the, the question session as well, I'll check with my bosses and see what they say. But they might say, no, you can't. Um, we'll see. OK, right. I'm switching off now because I need to go. Right. Bye. See you next week. Bye.